Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining our virtual event, Red, White, and Coup, Mapping Threats of Violence Around the 2024 Election. I'm Nora Benavidez, Senior Counsel and Director of Digital Justice and Civil Rights at the nonprofit Free Press. Please know that this conversation is a strictly nonpartisan discussion. We are on the record and we will put up the video on YouTube sometime later this week. So if you miss any part of it, you can catch up. We have the Q&A function set on, so please consider dropping questions in and I will get to those throughout our discussion. Now, today marks less than a week before election day. As many people have actually already voted, uh, mailed in their ballots, and communities are preparing for November 5th, but there is a rising climate of intensity and for some anxiety. Uh, let's be clear, elections often bring nerves. People are eager to learn the results of the election, some having been engaged deeply for months or even years. But this year brings added fears. Today, we will consider the stakes of 2024 and our election process. We will look at the fear, mongering, and intimidation that may actually not be credible, but contributes to voters' doubts about the legitimacy of our electoral process. And we will consider the possibility of violence, credible violence, in the days and weeks surrounding November 5th. I am honored, truly, to have three luminaries in the democracy and civil rights field joining this discussion today. If you do not know these folks, please seek them out. Find them on social media, find them anywhere, follow them, listen to them. They are doing the most tremendous work every day to protect democracy. And we have with us David Becker, executive director and founder of the Center for Election Innovation and Research. David has worked in the civil rights, democracy, and election space for decades. And I, I'm so excited for him to bring this expertise to share with us what he's seeing this election cycle. Um, we have with us Heidi Byrick, Chief Strategy Officer and Co-Founder of the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism. Heidi has also spent the better part of her career monitoring, tracking, documenting the rise of extremist movements here in the U.S. and around the world. Heidi, I don't know how you do it, and you stay so positive and glowing. And then finally, we have Damon Hewitt, President and Executive Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Damon is tremendous. He brings, again, decades of experience in the civil rights field, litigation, and policy realms. He has had leadership roles in nonprofit, philanthropy, public sector. These three luminaries really just, it's such an honor to have them here. So give them a welcome, uh, and let's dive in. And I'll be honest, we got a lot of buzz and interest around this event. It seems that the topic of political violence is, is one that many are sensitive to and curious to learn more about. And that is no surprise. The state of our society for many Americans is rocky. 50 to 64 percent of people say that they feel our democracy is in crisis. The Washington Post and the Shar School conducted a poll this month and found that two thirds of voters in states likely to decide the election don't feel that Donald Trump would accept defeat. 57% are very or somewhat worried that Trump supporters would turn violent if he loses. And these concerns are not without evidence of attempts to discredit the electoral process. Political violence has been increasing in the United States from the tenfold surge in threats that we have seen against members of Congress in the past decade to the two assassination attempts against Donald Trump this summer and fall. You know, just a couple of days ago on October 28th, the Department of Homeland Security issued a bulletin, a statement saying that domestic extremists are trying to disrupt the democratic process ahead of November's election. And there have been continued incidents uh, as the election nears. We've seen three different shootings at a Democratic campaign office for Vice President Kamala Harris in Arizona. This uptick in violence has been consistent since 2016, when Trump first made his presidential run. We've seen incidents of violence peppered throughout 2021, 2022, and last year. But the truth is a vast majority of Americans, regardless of their political affiliation, do not believe violence is the answer. 
And so in thinking about this worrisome climate, today we want to bring clarity for you where we can. I, I, we tried to think of who could really do justice to this very complex topic. How could we talk about with the right experts what violence could look like without naming it into existence? And so I really want to open us up by understanding the stakes this year. Um, I thought a little bit about starting with, with the villains that we're anticipating, but I don't think that's right, because this type of community, hundreds of people that came to this webinar, I think really want to start with ourselves and our communities. So Damon, I, I want to turn to you. You have been uh, a champion of civil rights and democracy for so long, and I really want you to help us understand this moment, you know, and what are the stakes for 2024? Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Nora, our free press and, and great colleagues uh, like David and Heidi uh, for this, this chance uh, to, to be in conversation. Uh, the, the stakes are very high. You know, it sounds so cliche that we hear it at least every four years, maybe every two years. It's the most important election ever. Democracy is on the line, but it really is. I think we're facing a unique set of cumulative impacts. So put aside all of the crazy stuff that we're going to talk about today, right? all the things that are potential violence and also uh, challenges to voters, what have you. Just keep in mind the baseline entering this election is about at least three things that have a cumulative impact. One is the significant wave of voter suppression laws of 2021, uh, which I think cannot be understated as really not a clap back to an Obama presidency or even the Shelby v. Holder case uh, but in the Supreme Court that undermined the Voter Rights Act, it's a clap back to 2020 election results, but also to massive turnout in 2020. Mm -hmm. The idea is let's have fewer people vote because that's probably good for certain interests of certain sides. The second compounding effect is hyperpartisan redistricting. Uh, the Supreme Court has opened Pandora's box by saying partisan gerrymandering is beyond the reach of federal courts to address. So it's open season. And we all know that Partisan gerrymandering uh, is often racial gerrymandering mandering and mask, right, in disguise, right? Uh, I think that the third thing is um, the vicious attacks on the voting rights act itself. I alluded to the Shelby County Beholder case. That All of that stuff is now essentially a normalized part of our electoral system. That's a baseline. And then you have the icing on the crap cake of the January 6th insurrection. So we have all of that entering this election cycle. And what have we seen as far as to your question, the stakes? We've seen, okay, uh, you know, we we it, it, it's okay to do some of these things. Now we're going to challenge and try to purge as many voters as possible. And so we've seen not only state action, which we're accustomed to, uh, which David, I know, litigated at the Department of Justice earlier in his career uh, so well, but we also now have heightened private activity, quite often partisan, of trying to purge and challenge as many voters as possible. And look, we just... We, we had a, a a momentary victory in a case in, in Virginia where over 1,600 people were ordered to be restored to the voter rolls, uh, upheld by the Court of Appeals. The Supreme Court this morning issued a stay on that. And so the court is already getting involved. Uh, and I think that's another thing to keep in mind. The stakes aren't just about who wins an election. The stakes are that at every turn, every nick and cranny, there's bizarre world. Things that should happen in the interest of democracy don't happen. Supreme Court getting involved now, absolutely ridiculous. I like to say unprecedented, but it's hard to say that anymore. Part of the long game of a lot of the purge litigation and even litigation on election certification, which I'll talk about briefly, is about let's make our way to the Supreme Court because then we'll have uh, partners in mayhem. And it's already started to happen today. Just a quick word about election certification. And I think George is the paradigmatic example uh, two different cases, or more than two cases, but two different issues. One is the so-called hand count uh, requirement, where the Board of Elections uh, Board of Elections said every vote cast by every Georgia voter must be counted by hand on election day. That's not going to take you one day. That's going to take several days. And that's the kind of thing that's tailor-made to throw results into doubt, to leave people on pins and needles, and often introduces, frankly, human error, right? Uh, into yeah. the to the process, right? The second thing is this whole discretionary certification piece. This question, well, if certifying elections is not mandatory, it's discretionary. Again, an effort to sow in a doubt. Can't forget the search for 11,000 plus votes in Georgia, right? The infamous, right? 
the conversation between Trump and Rassenberger, right? And again, speaking as a C3 nonpartisan organization, when I refer to someone who happens to be a candidate, it's not because they're a candidate, it's because of uh, the stakes that are issued. So I think that we've normalized some really bad things in this country, uh, or people have been uh, anesthetized and numb to them, and there's just more building on top of it. Um, We'll talk about violence in a bit, uh, potential violence. But, but what I say is, Nora, violence doesn't come out of nowhere. There are yeah. preconditions for it. Uh, and I'm not so, no sociologist, but normalizing crazy is certainly a precondition for violence to take place. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned the the legal battles that are casting doubt on our electoral process. Uh, for those that don't know, I'm actually based in Georgia, and I know that the you know we watched at, as the state election board passed these rules. Some were to reopen the 2020 certification process again, making suggestions like the the 2020 election was stolen or rigged somehow. Um, most of those rules have now been ruled unconstitutional by a judge uh, at the district level in Georgia, and then the Supreme Court of Georgia has ruled that. But these threats remain, and I, I think David, given that I see you all the time on TV, you're you're one of our sharpest legal minds. How do you make sense of this moment then legally, given what these various attacks look like that Damon has mentioned? That is such BS. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, Damon, I'm, being, I'm being Damon honest. Said, I'm fangirling. Da Damon and I uh, were colleagues at the Department of Justice. He has so much more experience than I do <laughs> in, in litigating these cases. But, um, he's the person I'd refer people to in uh, expertise on, on voting rights litigation. But um, look, I think we first need to take temperature of kind of where we are and where we've come from. And I think some of the things Damon said really led us into that conversation. I focus from a slightly different perspective on kind of the processes around our elections and the election administrators and public servants who run our elections. And the fact is, somehow, the, the, the hundreds of thousands of election workers and the millions of volunteers in this country who helped run the 2020 election somehow managed the highest turnout we had ever had in American history by 20 million more ballots than we'd ever seen before in the middle of a global pandemic. And their work has withstood four years of more scrutiny than any election, not in American history, in world history. And it has withstood that scrutiny. We know who won the 2020 election. It was not, it was the widest margin of any election in the 21st century when Barack Obama wasn't on the ballot. And, um, and, they're being, they've been threatened and abused and harassed for over four years now, not because they did a bad job, but because they did an outstanding job. And they showed their work and they did their work. They, they, it's, they, they, they were, they're American heroes in many ways. And these are the people that I work with. Um, as we head into this election, they're exhausted. And yet they're still getting the job done. As we sit here talking right now today, over 55 million Americans have already cast a ballot. And think about it. We haven't heard that many problems. We haven't heard about violence at the polling places. We haven't heard about long lines. We haven't heard about many problems. What the voters of this country are experiencing is that voting for the vast majority of people is going to be convenient and easy and secure and safe. And um, that's the message I really want voters to understand in these last six days, as some people who might be on the fence wondering whether they should turn out or not. Turn out and vote. Um, you're, you're going to have a good experience. Um, and your vote's going to count. But what we're also seeing is a steady stream of disinformation about the process. So, uh, a lot of it originating from overseas. We've seen a verified instance of Russians uh, circulating a fake video of ballots being destroyed in Pennsylvania. We are seeing a lot of it originating domestically, a lot of it coming from a presidential campaign and from the allies of uh, former President Trump. Um, we are... Uh, this disinformation is sucking up the bandwidth of election officials at their busiest time and trying to create noise that could affect voters as they're making a decision about how, where, when to vote. And um, that's that's something that's an ongoing concern. We're seeing litigation, as you pointed out, that is, it used to be the pre-election litigation, um, even if you disagreed with one side or the other, it was usually designed to set the rules and clarify them before the election occurred. Um, there were a lot of decisions I disagreed with in 2020, but 
at least they clarified them. For instance, there were there were just there were court decisions about how many drop boxes could be in counties in Ohio and Texas, and they limited them to one drop box per county. I personally didn't think that was a good decision, but at least it set the rules in advance. And the reality is that 85% of all pre-election litigation was won by Republicans in 2020. Post-election, mm -hmm. there was a very different situation because they didn't have any evidence to support any of their claims and they lost nearly 100% of all of their cases. But what we're seeing now is not so much litigation is designed to legitimately clarify the rules, even if there might be a disagreement about that. But we're seeing litigation is designed to set the stage for claims an election was stolen later that mm -hmm. have, would have the effect of... Uh, increasing the amount of distrust in the system. Claims uh, brought way too late and without much evidence or uh, legal basis about voter lists being inaccurate or about non-citizens being on the list or um, about mail ballot laws that have existed for literally decades in places like Mississippi and Nevada, or even about the processes and procedures that military and overseas voters have to follow in order to cast a ballot that have been around for nearly 40 years. And these have been dealt with by the courts mostly pretty well. Um, Damon yeah. raised some concerns that we're having, and there, there's clearly some issues that we're having with some recent cases, and I share those concerns. But most of the courts have looked at these cases and said, yeah, there's nothing to this. You don't have any claim here. We're going to throw this out. But, the, but it may be that these cases have the effect post-election. We're going to see these claims revived for, depending mm -hmm. on the outcome. And what, what's going to happen is these, these are going to probably be used to inflame the passions and the anger of people who supported the losing candidate. I also have to say right now, what I'm seeing in a lot of states, and I'm hearing this from Republicans primarily, is there is a lot of investment by allies of President Trump to suggest that his victory is inevitable, that there's no question he's going to win, that it's going to be a landslide. And I think all of us out here, I don't care who you're supporting, all the all the rational evidence that we're consuming right now would suggest this evidence, this election is going to be very close. I don't think anyone should be surprised by any outcome, regardless of who wins this election. So it's kind of irrational to think that there's one person who has this in the bag. But that's the expectation that's being set amongst some of his supporters. And imagine, I don't know who's going to win, but if he if he loses the election or or perceives that he's losing, you can imagine the shock that is going to be felt by his supporters and how that's going to be leveraged by grifters to try to anger them, to try to incite them to violence, and also importantly, to incite them to donate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'm very concerned about this. I am not concerned, and I know we probably will get to this later. I'm not concerned that there might be some secret plan for the loser to take to steal the election and take office. There might be a plan. It might be attempted. It's going to fail. The guardrails are in place. The states, the counties will certify, the states will certify, the governors will ascertain, the electors will meet, and Congress will count the ballots, the electoral ballots, the electoral votes as, as, they, were, as they were cast. But I don't think it's out of the question that the losing candidate may try to create a different impression and may desperately try to grab power in an effort that will fail, but could very likely incite violence, not just in the places that we've seen in the past, the efforts to attack the um, uh, the Detroit Counting Center, the, the TCF Center at the time, the you know efforts to uh, threaten and harass election officials in places like Georgia and Arizona, um, the, uh, the, the SUV full of weapons that was found outside of the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia, where they were counting mail ballots in the in the days after the election. I'm not just worried about those places. I'm worried about all the small counties, maybe even the deeply red counties, where there are activists who believe these lies that they've been fed for four years and may be incited to anger and violence. And um, and I, you know, I I think I think it could be a very volatile situation that we will come through but will we'll require a lot of fortitude on our part. Well, David, uh, you know, I had hoped that some of what you might describe was the durability of our systems. And you mentioned that at the top. I was hoping it could create a kind of anxiety sandwich for us as I turned to Heidi. But we're here, we've, we're addressing the elephant in the room that I think is on everyone's mind. But these are not new forces. And that's really why, Heidi, I want you to come in here, because 
as David and, and Damon have described, there's been a, a long structural attempt to undermine the rule of law, to make Americans question the legitimacy of our democratic processes. But there, there are these real grassroots seeds that I know you have been researching and documenting for years. Um, the, the work that you've been doing on, on understanding how extremism has grown, um, honestly is scary. <laughs> and, and I guess I, I think it's important for our audience to understand how disinformation and manipulation at scale are increasing a kind of rhetoric that scares people. And, and to some extent, that seems like it's the point. You know, we observe dehumanizing rhetoric about immigrant and minority groups. We heard, of course, at Trump's Madison Square Garden rally, a supposed comedian calling Puerto Rico an actual island of trash. Uh, we've heard claims about immigrants in Springfield, Ohio. And then there are these other types of actors who are not deputized with any authority. They're, they call themselves constitutional sheriffs, real law enforcement agents, but they've deputized themselves uh, working for God to stop a possible stolen election. And I guess I feel if anyone isn't surprised by all of these little markers, it's you. Um, and so what are you anticipating from these fringe actors in the days before and after Election Day? Yeah, well, unfortunately, all those things you mentioned, Nora, are a million times worse today than they were, say, a decade ago. Like we are living in an America that has a radicalized far right that is very different than just in the recent past. Every movement you talked about is larger, more organized, more problematic today than it was, say, five years ago, 10 years ago, and so on. Um, I, I want to say a couple things. I think David's point about voting being safe and secure and a positive um, experience is important. Um, people need to vote. And it's actually accurate even when you're talking about the most extreme forces that we monitor at the Global Project. And what I mean by that is we just did some research looking at violent comments on fringe, unmoderated platforms. Uh, these are places where neo-Nazis and white supremacists and other types of extremists live. And we, we combined that with election denialism and we compared the 2020 chatter online with the current chatter. And what we found in 2020, even with the explosion of political violence that happened after the election, right, leading up to January 6th, was that before voting day, there was very little of this talk. After voting day is when it exploded. We're seeing basically the same trend. There's a little bit more of this chatter right now prior to election day, but it's very not very much. We expect it will explode after election day. So I wanna say that to make voters feel safe. This is probably a post-election problem and not through, the, through next week, right? Next Tuesday. Um, the other things that are different today, we have a lot of serious extremists who are getting involved in the election process in ways they weren't. So I'm just gonna give you a few examples. The Proud Boys, which is a white supremacist group whose leadership has been jailed for sedition in January 6th. Their chapters have said that they're gonna show up at polling places. They were actually out on the streets during Super Tuesday. We have other white supremacists making these allegations. I don't know if they'll follow through with them, but that's what they're saying. So far, we don't have any evidence of that. Uh, the other thing that's worrisome is what happens after post-election. Votes are being counted. It's unclear what the result is. What kinds of actions are we gonna see out of these folks? I don't think it's going to be like 2020. That year, we had a lot of mobilization by extremist groups long prior to the election those who were counter-protesting the racial justice movements in the summer of 2020, the Stop the Steal movements. We had rallies in the streets. DC was subjected to some horrible violence from white supremacists who kept showing up there. We haven't seen that kind of mobilization this year. We don't have the anti-lockdown situation. So it's just, it's a different world in which election security has been heightened. Federal officials know more about these things. There have been more preparations. So I think we're in a better better place at least up until um, next Tuesday. But the, the fusion of election denial movements, I'm thinking of people like Cleta Mitchell, who was on that infamous phone call in Georgia that Damon was just talking about. 
the multiple organizations involved in election denial, whether it's a group like True the Vote or Mike Lindell has an offensive institute. There's there's dozens of these. They have really fused into corners of white supremacy and anti-government movements over the last few years. They've grown, they've grown bigger. They're more well-financed. They're more extreme. And their activities could be extremely disruptive post-election day, whether it's you know frivolous type stuff in the courts, narrative building, disinformation campaigns. I mean, the, the speed with which disinformation flows now is so shocking. Uh, Nora, you mentioned the allegations that Haitians were eating pets in Springfield, Ohio. That was something that came from a post by one neo-Nazi and within three days was everywhere. In the case of Hurricane Helen and in, in, in the devastation in the Asheville, North Carolina region, those conspiracies about FEMA and the government taking land and pushing people up, I mean, this stuff spread so fast with, that within days, militia members had traveled from Arizona into central North Carolina to react to that. Um, the other thing, the constitutional sheriffs that you mentioned. These are actual sheriffs, right? County sheriffs who've been elected to their positions, but they believe that they are the top law enforcement decider for their county, meaning the federal government has no role above them. They can insert themselves into election issues, ballot centers. I'm just using those examples. They also could stop gun control or whatever might happen on that front. They have become very, very close to election denying organizations like Cleta Mitchell's. And there has been talk already prior to the election about bringing the militias into areas along with the sheriffs where they're not happy with certification, counting, and so on. So I am a little concerned post-election what, what these folks are going to do. Um, if their preferred candidate doesn't win, how riled up they'll be. And, you know, I worry about the folks who are going to be counting our ballots. David mentioned some of the events that happened like in Detroit um, in 2020. Um, this is the kind of activity that I'm expecting. And, you know, it was very, very sad to see yesterday that the government in Air Maricopa County, Arizona, is going to put snipers on top of buildings where ballot counting is going to happen because they're that afraid of problems. So I'm thinking this is more of a post-election situation. And unfortunately, all these mobilized groups, constitutional sheriffs, white supremacists, militias, election deniers, they're going to be with us for the long term. So this isn't just about 2024. This is this is a problem we're going to have to address um, going forward. Yeah, Heidi, you bring up, uh, you know, the existential question, I think, which is, you know, how do we root out unacceptable, bigoted, misogynistic values? And Damon highlighted a little bit of, I think, the concerns with a society that normalizes values that are just truly disgusting. And across the world, we have seen that democracies, whether they are new or older and stronger and more durable, are suffering from these types of attacks of normalized, unacceptable values. Um, and so, uh, you know, that feels like its own conversation we have to have. But I, I want to stick with some of the, the temporal and chronological issues that we'll face here, because people have come to me, and I'm sure we, to you all, you know, asking about what and when. Um, November 5th, of course, many people will be voting if they haven't already. Uh, and of course, we know that just because our election results may not occur and come on election night, that does not mean the process is rigged or corrupt. In fact, it takes time. David, you said this so well. It takes time for our processes, for our election officials to do their jobs. But then there is this process that begins of the tabulation and the certification of results. And depending on where you are, audience members in different states, I don't know about you, but I sometimes clear my calendar in those days. You know, I'm like, well, let's we're worried. That's almost the wrong reaction. We we have to find community in those moments. But you refresh your feed, you refresh your feed, uh, waiting for something. And I think there will be heightened, uh, palpable anxiety in those days. I'd love David Damon for you both to share. You know, what can we expect, at least in the, the few days right after November 5th? What is that process like? And are there heightened risks for disinformation to thrive, knowing that there could be premature claims of a victor in certain states? 
So, so I'll I'll start. Um, and Nora, you accuse me of being a pessimist, which I which I, I'm so I, I'm I, that's definitely not the space I like to live in. I'm going to get pretty optimistic. Well, we had to we had to get spicy, you know, because I mean, I mean, I, I mean, the risks are what they are, and Heidi and Damon laid them out very well, and they and and they're real, and they concern me. But um, I'll I'll. And and hopefully at the end, we'll get to wrap this up because overall, I'm very optimistic about where we're going to be at the end of all this. It's just going to be a bit of a trial by fire that we're going to have to deal with in the meantime. But uh, with regard to election day and election night, one thing I like to say about election day, um, it is it's the, one of the most difficult days for the media. And I work with many of them. It is the day when demand for news is at its peak and supply of news is zero. Everyone has one question they want answered and nobody has the answer to that question. So what do the cable news vans do? They drive around town looking for the one polling place that has problems when most of them are doing pretty well. Understandable. But then we're all on edge. Heidi, you mentioned this. We Look, we, we the stakes are high. We all have very strong opinions about who we'd like to see win. Um, that's true of all Americans, by the way. I mean, there are, you know, there are going to be people who vote opposite of each other who, who feel like the stakes are high. Um, we need to understand some simple facts. One is that we have never counted ballots on election night, all the ballots on election night, literally never in American history. There's a reason the Constitution says the electors meet six weeks after Election Day. If we counted them the first night, we they could probably meet on the Wednesday after Election Day. That's not what happens. It takes a long time to count our ballots. Why does it take so much longer in America than many other places? As most of you know, look at your ballots. They're often multiple pages and dozens of races. That is unlike any other ballot anywhere in the world. Most of the places in the world, when they vote, they vote on one race and that's it. It's very easy to count those ballots very quickly. It is hard to count a 79 contest ballot on four pages in Maricopa County as quickly as others would say. So that's normal. We have complicated ballots. It takes some time to count them. We're not just counting the presidential race on election night. And it has always taken us days. I was on C-SPAN yesterday, and there was a caller from Florida saying, "Florida in Florida, we've always had all the ballots counted since 9 p.m. And I'm like, have we really forgotten so quickly? First of all, 2000 happened. We did not know who won Florida, the presidential race in 2000. But just in 2018, for those of you that are kind of recent uh, history uh, nerds about elections. In 2018, both the governor's race and the U.S. Senate race were decided by 0.25% in, in Florida. It took several days before we knew who won, even though Florida reports ballots very, very quickly. So we should just expect election officials, our neighbors, members of our community who are working in election offices are working many times 24 seven to count those ballots. And the biggest difference between what's happening now and what happened earlier is not that we're counting ballots slower, we're actually counting them as fast as ever. It's that the margins are much narrower. And when the margins are narrower, it takes longer to know who won. The analogy I use often um, is imagine a big fishbowl full of red and blue jelly beans. If that fishbowl is 90% red, you probably don't need to count the jelly beans in the jar to know that red has more jelly beans. If it's maybe 65% red, you probably need to count a bunch of that jelly bean jar before you know for sure that red has won that. But if it's 50.1% blue and 49.9% red, you're gonna need to count to the bottom of that jelly bean jar. And you might, you might need to recount too, just to make sure, because it's really close. And that's why it takes us some time to know who wins. But relevant to this discussion, it is unquestionably true that the candidate who thinks they are losing may try to use that vacuum of time, that time between when the polls close and when the media can call the race to try to spread disinformation. I think it's very possible we'll see former President Trump claim victory on election night, even though there's no way he will know who won or not. And I would suggest that people um, who, who are watching on election night, if that happens, listen closely to what he says at the time. And it's not because there's any basis for his claims or he knows who won at that time because he likely doesn't. It's because it will tell you about his mindset as to whether he thinks he won. Um, if he claims widespread fraud, non-citizen voting fraud, bad voter lists, mail voting fraud, uh, voting machines being hacked or rigged, that tells you something because the candidate who thinks they're winning has every incentive to legitimize the process that's going to deliver them a victory. It's only the candidate that thinks they're losing that spreads spreads those kinds of lies before we can see it. So watch that through that lens. 
But also be aware that that's going to be a perilous time because election workers are working overtime. Um, Heidi indicated the precautions they've taken. I, I actually think it's unfortunate they have to take those precautions, but I think it's good they're taking those precautions. Election officials are ready for this. They protected their sites as best they can. It, hopefully we'll get to the point where they don't have to ever again. But even if there are attempts to undermine that process, even during that very perilous time in the days until the media counts, and then as counties and states recount and audit those results, perhaps prior to certification, the efforts to try to undermine that process, the attempts to try to undermine county certification, those, those are likely to happen, I would even say, or very, very possible. But I will also say, because I want to be optimistic, and, I'm, and I, I mean this truly, these efforts are going to fail. It doesn't mean election officials aren't going to have to suffer through some abuse and harassments and threats. It doesn't mean that there aren't going to be some vile things attempted that we should never see in the United States of America. But these efforts are going to fail. And I can say that with absolute certainty. Damon, please jump well, in. I'm just, um, if we bring back Schoolhouse Rock on election certification, I want David Becker to write the script or to be the voice. <laughs> No, seriously, because you just you just gave us, you know, I wouldn't even call it a treatise. It's a very accessible way to understand what's that what's happening. I, so just to build upon that, you said it so well, David. I I would just point folks to a couple of key dates, not for agita or anxiety, but just for watchfulness. Uh, one, obviously, there's election day, uh, but then there's also um, when electors vote in their states because of the electoral college. It's not just a popular vote; it's when the electors vote. So no one's been talking lately in the media about the faithless elector issue. I haven't been hearing a lot about that. Um, people who say, I don't care how the people voted, I'm gonna vote this way. Uh, and of course, some states have pledges to follow the popular vote, right? Um, as well, right? Uh, or laws, right? So um, another key day to watch obviously is January 6th, the day that Congress counts the votes. And speaking of potential for faithless electors, so to speak, uh, there is, um, I don't believe it's a um, any real legal doubt, but it, the court courts have not determined the question of what could Pence have done in the 2020 election, right? The, to what Trump wanted him to do, uh, to you know whatever he said, do the right thing, whatever Trump thinks the right thing would have been, right? Like so that I'm not going to say, oh, it's an open question. I will say the courts haven't addressed that that legal issue to my knowledge and colleagues if. If, if I'm wrong on that, please please chime in, because I'm wrong at least once or twice a day, uh, sometimes many times a day. So what I, what I would also say is that, so watch those dates, and then just from kind of a security and sanity perspective, watch inauguration day no matter what. I mean, what we're seeing, you know, we have at the Lawyers Committee our James Byrd Jr. Center to Stop Hate, named in honor of the late James Byrd, that we work with his family and other survivors, uh, you know the the whole ethos behind the center is that we have we want to try to eradicate hate, especially weaponized with violent hate, as much as possible. Sadly, I do believe if Trump wins, there's going to be a rise in hate because he'll be a have a platform for it. If Harris wins, there'll be a massage war like we've never seen before. Um, attacks uh, that are very d despicable, dismissive, not just of her, but anyone who's aligned with or looks like her. So I think we have to brace ourselves for more ugly, no matter what. I, I will, I'll, I'll be remiss to not note that uh, you mentioned the Proud Boys that maybe you or Heidi did earlier. Uh, we are suing the Proud Boys, I think for probably the third time. Um, and the case in which that's active right now uh, is a case uh, regarding the January 6th insurrection, where defendants also include Trump, his 2020 campaign, not the current campaign, um, and also the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and 24 of their uh, closest alleged co-conspirators or friends. Uh, we believe that they involved were involved in a conspiracy to violate civil rights. And even though we do a lot of police accountability work, our clients in that case are Capitol Police officers. Most of them actually happen to be black men, not all of them, who defend their life, liberty, property, but also democracy itself on that day. Mm -hmm. In terms of what to expect, I think you can expect heightened presence uh, much tighter and better. That's without judging the past. Coordination amongst um, all forms of law enforcement, uh, local, uh, federal, uh, of, of various types. So I don't think there's going to be any um, uh, blind spots or gaps uh, that are kind of clear and obvious, so to speak. Uh, but 
there'll be heightened, you know, presence in security. And I think what's good, what leaves people on edge is the notion that people will challenge things in court, as David said. People will rally outside. That doesn't mean that there's going to instantaneously be violence. So we don't want people to think just because you see someone with the sign or with the banner that there should be immediate trepidation and fear of violence. What we do know is that our effort and our litigation and in, in our multiple lawsuits against these types of hate groups or groups that espouse hate, I should say, um, is to both delegitimize their ideology, but frankly, also to destabilize the organizations. And there's no one court victory that does all of that, certainly not on the delegitimization front, uh, because they continue to, continue to sprout up. Uh, destabilizations happen to some extent. Uh, you're, like, you're unlikely to see certain individual actors uh, in the streets in D.C. in the next uh, couple of months. That's in part because they're either in prison or because they're banned from the district. Uh, because of what they've done in the past, what they've been alleged to do and proven to do in the past. So there is, um, I call it clear and present danger, but there's also, frankly, substantial vigilance and substantial uh, you know, protections uh, that, that are in place. Um, one thing I want just to revert back to is something David said so importantly that you know, election day is the one day everybody wants lots of news, but there's really no news. We really have to watch out for, uh, forgive the phrase, uh, voter suppression porn and um, all other times, of, uh, other forms of, of that, right? So, you know, we talk to the mainstream media all the time, or all media, frankly, about we will tell you if we see bad things, but we also don't want you to think that just because the worst things aren't happening, that we should normalize all the rest. Like, it shouldn't take this many nonprofit, nonpartisan organizations just for people to be able to cast a ballot and have the ballot be counted. It shouldn't take litigation. So while we all, I think, have faith in systems and processes that in the end they will work, it shouldn't take this much, and we darn sure shouldn't normalize any of it. Damon, I think that's really important to stress. And I often say I my goal is to work myself out of a job in this field. I, I think that's the goal we should all have in this field to the point where democracy is a practice we all engage in every day. And it's one that we support all of us. Um, I, you know, we're starting to get a lot of questions in the chat and we have a, a little over 15 minutes together. So I want to start addressing some of these and I'll fold them together because we have uh, over a dozen now. Um, I want to start with the the issue of ballot drop off sites and the fires that uh, we've seen in a few places. Just yesterday, I spoke with students in Washington state. We've seen these drop off sites in Oregon be lit on fire. There have been various uh, reports from media that you know, domestic extremists are planning their drop off site burn uh, plans throughout the next several weeks and particularly in the next six days. Heidi, what does this do to voters? Um, and I know you've studied the, you know, voter intimidation, fear, how that plays out um, for real people. You know, this is the one area where I think there has been a, 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 have been very troubling things happening. The, the boxes that were burned in Oregon and Washington had incendiary devices placed inside of them, which is a very dangerous situation. Of course, vote, um, ballots were destroyed in the Vancouver, Washington instance. This is the result of the intense demonization of drop boxes by the election denial movement. This wasn't even something that was discussed before 2020 in these ways. Now, every single one of these groups goes on and on and on about the drop boxes in particular being a perversion of the vote. So I wasn't surprised to see those kinds of um, destruction of boxes. They were surveilled back in uh, 2020 as well. True the Vote, which is one of the biggest election denying organizations, has the intention of creating what they call a reality TV show where they're going to put AI cameras on ballot boxes and have sheriffs standing there. These are real intimidation actions, and they can have an effect on people's willingness to vote. It's the one place that I see on voting that I have some some concerns and just the destruction of the ballots. Right. People losing their vote um, in that route. Uh, and so I, I expect this to continue up through Election Day, unfortunately, and law enforcement is going to have to keep an eye on those on those drop boxes to protect them and protect the people who are going to vote at them. 
Well, there are more questions about where some of the, you know, incidents of violence may occur. And one question was about, are we, do you all anticipate that, you know, rural areas or more urban or suburban areas could be vulnerable to attacks? And is there on the ground organizing or other measures to prepare for that? Sure. I, you know, I guess that, you know, the acts of violence or mayhem have effect only when they have an audience. And so the audience is either real people in person or live or recorded images of real people experiencing it. So I think that's why your your more heavily populated areas are, are you know, perhaps at, you know, a higher alert, I would say. Um, the truth is, though, you can actually cause you can have more instances of harm in areas where there are fewer eyes, but it may not have the desired effect. I mean, evildoers like an audience, so I think that's that's the 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 general logic uh, there. Um, I, I would also say that, um, yeah, you just places where you have like more foot traffic, it's actually harder to uh, spot and assess, you know, threats unless it's a confined environment. I'll, I'll stop with that because I'm not a security expert, but I think that's kind of the, the pure logic of where we've seen these things happen. Plus, I think the mayhem is, like, I think that as much as people talk about political violence, I think there's a significant overlap between political violence and racialized violence. So, I, you know, I'm not saying that all the violence is against people of color, but I think there's a there's a fair amount either in the, in terms of who's physically harmed potentially or who's the subject of the rhetoric. So I think you there are you know, people of color in rural areas, no doubt. Uh, but I do think that for a lot of different reasons, it's the more heavily populated areas that folks are thinking about. Can I build on that a little bit? Yeah, Nora? Because I, I, think, I think the point that Damon made about audiences is really important. One of the things I have a great deal of concern about is most, uh, most uh, election voting related violence um, is, is very isolated and episodic. Um, think of, for instance, the armed individual outside of Maricopa County drop box in 2022, um, when there were hundreds of other places to drop off a ballot. But I believe that it's very, it's very likely to be to have the effect and perhaps be designed to actually create a, a, a fear amongst voters. One of the easiest ways to suppress voters to get them to self suppress out of fear or some other false belief. And and this is why I always stress that writ large, if you're looking at early voting right now, and there are groups like Damon's who work on those individuals that have legitimate barriers put in front of, no, I'm sorry, not legitimate barriers, but have who are legitimately faced mm -hmm. with barriers that they shouldn't have mm -hmm. to face. Um, the vast majority of voters are having a smooth voting experience. And there's nothing approaching violence at any of these sites. And they have choice where if they're a little bit uneasy, they can vote by mail or they can vote early in person and they can be a moving target for uh, people who might try to intimidate them or uh, spread disinformation to them. And I think it's really important not to give too much oxygen to those during the voting period, because we have to recognize a presidential election is an election where give or take around 40 percent of all the people who vote are not frequent voters. They're voters who might vote once every four years. They default to not voting in a lot of elections. And if they fear that voting could be unsafe, they might be less likely to turn out. And I don't think any of us wants that by any means. So I think keeping that in mind, keeping a, keeping in mind that the, the, that the threat environment creating fear might exactly be one of the goals. It makes the job of those of us working in democracy so much harder because we also we have to we have to speak out and and against threats of violence. But we also have to make sure that just the existence of these threats of violence doesn't intimidate the voters who we're trying to protect. Can I can I just add something about a particular community that's facing a lot of harassment this year? And this is building on Damon's point about people of color being targeted. A lot of the election denialism is focused on what is what they call non-citizen voters right now. Election denier groups have created these form letters. People have in that movement have talked about going into quote unquote ethnic areas to deliver this message. And I just want to say to folks in the neighborhoods that might be targeted to not be intimidated by these tactics. It's it's gross and despicable what is happening with these lies about, you know, undocumented people voting in mass. There's no proof for it at all. But if you feel like something is wrong here or you're being targeted in some way, I just want to point you to lawyers committees hotline and all of their legal work, 
because that's where you should reach out. You should not be intimidated by these kinds of groups and get the facts through a route like that. Thanks, Ida. I'll just make sure folks know it's, um, we, we administer the Highlight the Lawyers Committee. Election Protection is a coalition of over 300 organizations. Many operate at the local and state level, a number of them national. Nora, you've done election protection in the past uh, as part of the coalition. Uh, Doing it again this elsewhere. year. That's right. And so the hotline number is 866-OUR-VOTE, 866-OUR-VOTE. You can also go to 866-OUR-VOTE.org online. You can also uh, do WhatsApp chat, or you can even text. Um, and there's Facebook Messenger, too. So 866-OUR-VOTE uh, will meet you where you are uh, in terms of the means that in which you want to communicate. Just don't at me. <laughs> can, I, can I just <laughs> throw in an additional plug? Because it was long ago that I also volunteered. But um, this ah. is election protection is nonpartisan. They're, not, they're yeah. never going to ask you who you're voting for. They don't care. Like if you're yeah. having a problem that you think can be resolved, you need some advice or assistance, 866 hour vote. It's just a great resource. And uh, all credit to Damon and his team at the lawyers community and all the partner organizations that work on it. It is a it, it's a really important nonpartisan resource uh, that everyone should know about. Well, thank you all. You know, I, I want to close. We've gotten so many more questions and unfortunately we have to wind down. And I want to end with one final question, which has already been hinted at, but it's about action items. Uh, you know, we've learned today that information as warfare, um, law as warfare, there are these various sectors vulnerable to manipulation. And yet, what I have heard overwhelmingly from all three of you is that despite the fear mongering, the intimidation attempts and the structural attempts to undermine or remove the buttresses of our legal system, democracy remains durable. That does not mean that we are immune from attack. It means that when attacked, the systems have integrity. And, and I hear that from all three of you with, of course, the caveats and the fears and the concern. But all of that said now, we're, we're six days away from the election. We have, you know, weeks more where many people will be holding their breath. What can people do, whether it's lawyers, media, or others? Who do you want to start with that? David, you're on. Hot mic. Let's Damn, do it. I made a mistake there. Um, <laughs> I think there are several things. First of all, I, really importantly, uh, spread the word. We are six days away from the election. If you're holding on to a mail ballot, um, I would advise at this point that you do one of two things. You finish your mail ballot and you deliver it directly to election officials, either an election office or through a Dropbox. I would not put it in the mail at this point, no matter where you are. Um, or alternatively, you can take your mail ballot to a polling place, an early voting site or your polling place on Election Day, surrender it and vote a regular ballot. Either one is a wonderful option. There's choices. 97% of people in the country have access to early voting. Literally, as we sit here, 45 states in D.C. are offering early voting. There are going to be two more states that join later this week, Oklahoma and Kentucky, to make 47 states where it's available. Use it. It's a wonderful way. I voted early in person. I love voting that way. But if you have a mail ballot and you like voting mail ballot. Don't put it in the mail now. Return it directly to election officials. Secondly, be very careful about your consumption of media. Trust official sources, particularly election officials. You're going to see disinformation and it it's it, disinformation is going to be highly targeted. It might be targeted at you, designed to make you angry, be especially skeptical of videos or audio or any disinformation that seems to reinforce your pre-existing beliefs. Take a pause, hit the pause button. There, there's This is not just directed by or caused by one side. It is disproportionately directed and caused by one side. But I guarantee you, after this election, our foreign adversaries in places like Russia, China, and Iran, whether they get what they want, Russia right now is very clearly intervening on the side of Donald Trump. But even if Trump wins, they are all going to shift towards spreading disinformation designed to get anyone who supported the losing candidate to be angry and potentially violent. So be very skeptical of that. They have a huge incentive at dividing and weakening our nation, and they're going to continue to do that. So be a be a smart media consumer. Be careful about things that make you angry, even though you might legitimately feel concern and anger. It's very easy and understandable to do that. But I think that's going to be out there. And lastly, be patient. 
Like this process is going to play out. It has guardrails. There are going to be people who want to make you feel as if chaos is inevitable. Don't allow that. That absolves them of the responsibility that they should feel for having created the chaos. The chaos right now we're seeing this, planting the idea that no matter what happens post-election, it's going to be chaotic. We're talking to you honestly about things that we think could likely happen. But if they do happen, they will have been caused. There will be individuals who are responsible for them, and we should hold them accountable for having caused that. It is not inevitable that an election should be, have have this feeling of angst where we're not even sure the winner will take office, although, as I said, they will take office. Damon and Heidi both referenced that. This is not normal, and but we should not absolve those who are creating the chaos, who are creating the vision from their responsibility for having done that. Love it, Bob. I would say make a plan. Uh, I think that plan includes not just who you want to vote for, which everybody should be thinking about uh, generally, uh, so you don't have to figure it out in real time, but check your registration status. Um, in a lot of places, it's still not too late because you can do same day registration. I think it's 23 states in, in DC. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to rely on just that. Check your status now. If you can vote early, do it. Uh, you heard about early voting, uh, you know, previously we just had national early voting day. Um, and I, I voted early yesterday myself and that I had a benefit of like having thoughtful conversation with a number of people on various propositions and races on the ballot, uh, before I walked in. Um, so it w it was actually, you know, an enough people to where there was some energy to the place, but also not so many people to where I was in a really long line. Uh, so I was very fortunate, uh, where I live. Uh, go to your trusted messengers. Um, David is so right about being conspicuous as about, about your media consumption or information consumption writ large. Go to your trusted messenger. Don't just take what somebody gives you, but but you know take the time to discern for yourself. But also call a six six I vote. Call the election protection hotline if you have questions ranging from where do I vote, which may seem simple until you realize that your polling site has actually changed three times since the twenty twenty election. Um, or it may be something where you want to report intimidation. Sometimes uh, the disinformation and intimidation turns into things that we can act upon as lawyers and with our legal volunteers to make sure that that stuff doesn't happen anymore. I, I'm just completely down with everything David and Damon had said. And if we follow those rules, check the media, make a plan, then we don't let these bad actors who want to disrupt this process or suppress the vote or somehow manipulate the vote win. So please, please do these things and, and make sure you go out and vote, get your voice heard. Heidi, Damon, David, thank you so much for your expertise. You know, sometimes it feels corny to say, but voting is one of the most powerful ways that we make our own voices heard. Um, and who we elect to represent us can affect the potholes in our communities, what our kids have for lunch, all the way up through the highest federal decisions that are made about foreign policy and otherwise. Um, so this is a moment where we all play a role. I want to provide three resources for you. At the end of a discussion like this, I know it can sort of feel like hand-wringing. Where do we go from here? You've heard from these tremendous experts. Uh, our Democracy Is initiative is an incubator to imagine what democracy can look like. We have dozens of partners that have joined this effort. We will share out resources with our audience after this event, including a link to the event discussion on YouTube. We have newsroom guides for reporters, and I, I know we have dozens of reporters here right now. These guides help explain old and new lies that we may anticipate, you know, the next big lie about non-citizen voting and how newsrooms can cover these narratives. We have materials on how to prepare everyday people for political violence. We will share that. And then I, I know we've gotten questions about protests and legitimate free speech, and we will share out the protest guides that we've created. All of these are intended to help real people like you and me make sure that at the very least we are educated, we are informed, we are ready to surround ourselves with community. So thank you all so much. We look forward to seeing you on the other side. It sounds like we need a round two, so stay in touch. <laughs>